सुप्रभाषेशन एक पर्यावरण शिक्षक हैं 1966 में दिल्ली में उनका जन्म हुआ और सुप्रभा विभिन्न कृष्णमूर्ति स्कूलों में पढ़ी पिछले तीन दशकों से सुप्रभा केरल में गुरुकुल वनस्पति अभ्यावरण में रहकर काम करती हैं अभ्यावरण का काम इस आधार पर है कि प्रकृति ही गुरु है और प्रकृति के सभी प्राणी एक परिवार मात्र हैं हिंसा और अहिंसा के सूक्ष्म तत्वों के साथ लोगों और पर्यावरण के बीच एक स्वस्थ गठबंधन बनाने के लिए सुप्रभा प्रयत्नशील हैं नमस्ते सुप्रभा एंड वेलकम वॉम वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन सो दिस इज एन अनयूजल कॉन्वर्सेशन इन दिस सीरीज बिकॉज सो फार वी हैव बिन मोस्टली टॉकिंग अबाउट ह्यूमन टू ह्यूमन वायलेंस नॉन वायलेंस इशूज एंड ऑल्सो अबाउट द स्ट्रक्चरल वायलेंस ऑफ द इकोनॉमिक सिस्टम Uh, and today uh, with you suprabha i am hoping we can cover a much larger and deeper area of how the violence and non violence dynamic plays out in nature uh, so let's start with the question i ask everyone uh, what is your earliest memory of ahimsa either as an idea or as a practice or as a challenge or as an absence mhm um thank you rajni for inviting me into this conversation um i have never really engaged with the idea of ahimsa but obviously you know it's like in the air around you i grew up in delhi for a few years and then uh, moved south with my parents and um one important a uh, part of my life was that they were both my parents were both part of a movement um which was really born out of civil disobedience conscientious um, objection and um so this was called service civil international and in the 60s was a uh, you know was it came out of the world war world war 1 when someone in switzerland took a bunch of german youth over to france to rebuild uh, you know a, a a village that had been destroyed so it kind of grew into something international and the core idea is working together very physical um practical work to break down prejudice and uh, prejudice at all levels and however it exists notions of you know categorizing people and then treating people in a certain way so home when i was a child was uh, was full of all kinds of people from around the world but around india around delhi and also it ranged from refugees lots of tibetan refugees were in the home and i so i grew up with uh, tibetan kids and and also people from all over delhi and childhood was to travel to all these places and to look at how people can work together to recreate a world that is good for all mm-hmm. so in that sense one has um, one has had a very um, um uh tacit in one way but also very practical an imagination that involved working together mm-hmm. and anyone so you didn't realize at least i could not have bracketed people so easily growing up the way i did um and so in in that sense it's a very inclusive world without stating inclusion it was just normal and natural that people came together to literally work Wonderful. and home also included you know stray dogs and plants and you know it was a very urban life in delhi so the the whole engagement with non humans began later mm-hmm. and did the krishnamurti school life at the krishnamurti school also play a role in in framing your world view oh very much in what way um, so one thing was that this i i went to the first krishnamurti school i've been to three um i went to the first one when i was uh, 11 becoming 12 and so still very young you know the adolescent period and um 
you know, it was in a wild or a rewilding place, a place that had been made very barren by previous, you know, use. And then, and then so to witness how the land comes back to life and from very early on to have this kind of, um, you know, daily awareness of many kinds of beings and not just human beings. So the attention was always directed to human and non-human uh, participants in the landscape. And all this was not really against state. So the language has come much later, but as a child, I knew, you know, being an urban kid to have seen jackals and, um, you know, the owls and scorpions and snakes and so on. So they were very, very much a part of one's whole psychology and, and sociology. Did this teach you early in life that to live is to be part of some form of violence to the extent that all life subsists on other life? My sense of the word violence is not the act of hunting, killing and eating. You know, so I tend to see violence as something that is... Um, you know, subjugation has an element of sadism in it, is suppressive and does not um, contribute to the community as a whole. So I understand that all, all life, all organic life is, involves the act of eating somebody. And of course, obviously, now we know how we are eaten by other beings as we speak. So the act of eating is a momentary act of transgression. And obviously it's not pleasant for the one being eaten, you can say. But there is something in, uh, you know, that whole interconnection food uh, 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 cycles that uh, is part of creating diversity. Somehow the community benefits. Uh, the members of the other members of the clan benefit. Um, so I have never looked at violence in, you know, jaws and claws and, you know, red and tooth and claw and all that. I've never seen it that way in nature. Mm -hmm. I have witnessed, you know, quite some acts of um, praying and killing. But uh, the word violence doesn't pop up in my head. Whereas when I see, you know, someone beating a dog and a chained dog, that or a, or a child, you know, I remember early memory of, a, of a, some boys in a, not in the Krishnamurti school in another school I went to using a magnifying glass to torture an ant and then it kind of like fries up, you know, with the concentrated focus of the rays of the sun. So those were, you know, what is that? There's a, this sadism that keeps uh, beings on leashes and chains and also peoples and all that. Yeah. Yes. So nature as violent, nature is at times violent, but most of the time it's not being violent. Most of the time it's being all sorts of things. Yeah. How then do you, did you find yourself reacting to the commonly used term in India that distinguishes society, Samaj, from Jangal Raj? And where jungle Raj is a term used in a pejorative sense. How, how do you mm. respond? You know, what, what emotions or what responses does that evoke in you? Well, you mean basically civilized and the uncivilized and so on. Um, I was lucky to never really have that as part of my worldview. Um, I went towards wilder and wilder places, but I never felt myself to be estranged from that which is you know, natural and wild and just a creature, you know. So I was lucky in that uh, whether it was, it was not an active conscious thing in my parents, but definitely um, the Krishnamurti schools by directing attention to other beings reduced that distinction between that which is wild and feral and out of control and yourself. And the whole inquiry was, you know, the, the making of the ego itself is a, is a form of violence you know, that you are acculturated, you are conditioned, you are, you know, indoctrinated, persuaded into being something that is not who you are, who you really are. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I, I have seen the violence of the city, I would say, mm -hmm. and my life has been a quest to find that which is 
um, more primordial and of its own of its own willfulness and being. Mm. So the the sense of the jungle raj as being this uncontrollable, uncontrolled and uncontrollable place. Mm. Uh, to me, that is the natural state of affairs. Mm. And if right. you don't relate with it, you mm. are destroying the planet. You know, it, it leads to consequences as as diverse as um, you know agriculture as being this controlled, tamed environment where you're cultivating certain crops at the expense of that which wishes to be there on its own. Yes. Um, so how does how did that get to be a civilizing act? How did Samaj get to be this act of choosing who is part of it and who is not? So how, Suprabha, would you define the notion of balance in nature, both among the rest of nature and between humans and nature? Humans have been part of nature for the longest time. And uh, so I take that as a kind of a given that the body, the human body is one of nature's creations. Um, but there is something that we have done or we are doing this world of artifacts and, and things and the whole industrial process of processing the body of the world into a lifeless object that has estranged us and that is not just a recent industrial period but it is an ongoing period and you know definitely the caste system has contributed to the alienation of body from the wild you know um so so in in my thought human is part of the universe human is part of nature human human to be human is to be part of of a community of beings even as we sit in this environment, which is relatively, you know, empty of other life forms, they are around. But the question of balance comes when, so I, again, that's not a question that I really engage with balance. You know, that's very much to do with your perception of what is balanced and what is imbalanced. But, um, but when you recognize the self-willed nature of other beings and you exist in a dynamic with them, then uh, there's a different sort of balance that comes in just from being in relation. So in relation with you, in relation with a lizard, in relation with a tree, that notion of balance comes. And then through culture and the transmission of culture, you also hear the stories of what happens when all the trees get cut down and then the rivers dry up. And then, you know, so something very terrible happens to the, for the human being as well. So it's not humans and nature. It is that when something happens, everybody suffers. You know, so that, that humans are out of balance with nature is one way of looking at it. But hu the human being is also under assault right now. Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate on uh, what you just said about how the caste system has been a part of or one of the reasons for the nature, alienation of humans from nature? A little bit more if you could say about that. Well, um... How did it happen that this immense diversity of human cultures, which must have been present in this land, um, how did they go from being, you know, in connection like this to something that was stacked this way? Um, and uh, my sense is that at the time of the advent of agriculture and of city states and kingdoms, that you started to have concentrations of people and um, in these concentrations of people where the wild was estranged and far away, and then you had the agricultural and rural landscapes where, you know, this kind of this thing that's happening between people who are cultivating and then the wild beings who are coming in and trying to be, you know, trying to reclaim their land and agriculture itself destroying that, you started to get these, these tiered relationships, the wild, then the domesticated, then the people who had to, who couldn't be, uh, who had to be alienated to deal with the waste that was coming out of these city states, and then the occupations being progressively to, turned towards creating something for the elite. Whereas, if those traditional, let's say in the Adivasi cultures, you're not creating objects for an elite. 
you know, it, and it, it is so, um, you know, the, the techniques are so democratic that it goes back into the earth, you know, it's utilized and then it goes back into the earth. But how does it happen that this whole thing gets built up into this sort of hierarchized, militarized, progressively estranged from wilderness, and then, and then the gods and deities getting put into, you know, enclosures, um, no longer in the actual mountain, in the actual, you know, uh, rock, in the actual stream, but in representations, which you then have a relationship with a representation and not with the actual being. So, you know, I don't want, I don't want to theorize about it, but I just see a, a sort of progression of alienation. Over the years that you have been part of the uh, Gurukul Botanical Sanctuary, can you... Uh, say more about what were the completely unique ways that you saw uh, what it meant to be human. Because I know you have a lot to say on the ways in which the people who live in these environments, uh, whether they are indigenous tribes or uh, not, uh, how they have uh, if I understand correctly, almost a symbiotic relationship with nature. Would it be fair to say, Suprabha, that there are also hierarchies uh, of uh, uh, power and consumption in nature or, or, am, or am I completely off the mark there? Yeah, I feel that that has been one of the most dangerous ideas that has come out of, uh, um, you know, the great chain of being and... Um, the stacking of order, the pyramid as having, you know, the primary producers at the base and then the secondary and then the tertiary and then the predator at the top. Those are some of the most dangerous ideas to have come out of both modern science and also I would say the caste system. Um, that you don't see beings in relationship, you see hierarchies. So you're, you have a lens of seeing hierarchies and that's what you see. So might is right and, you know, bigger is better. And then the more powerful you are, the more, you know, um, you can kill, et cetera. But, you know, having lived in the forest uh, and I'm, I also have my own filters. It's, it's not, I'm not saying that I don't have filters, but why is the forest such a diverse place? And why are the agricultural landscapes so reduced? You know, why has the domestication of creatures happened? Um, and why is there such immense suffering in this, you know, in, and a, at a planetary scale, you know, the entire subjugations of peoples and lands and creatures and factory farms and so on. Whereas when you, you know, spend a bit of time in this immense um, community, which is ancient, it's, you know, it has survived, not just survived, it has thrived for a hundred million years. Um, and, and you see not one creature, you don't see two, you see hundreds, thousands of different beings. And uh, they don't look like they are in a constant uh, state of service to one other. You know, there's different things going on, a different play of many, many things, a different ways of being in the forest. And um, so um, cooperation, perhaps, or, um, or, you know, play, perhaps, or, um, you know, uh, awe and silence and uh, intermingling, interbeing. So where has this idea, so I feel that the whole Darwinist, neo-Darwinist way of thinking, you know, has the survival of the fittest. You know, so those are lenses that have been put into place very powerfully through most of modern education. And you go into an, a, a society that hasn't had that as its primary you know, lens, you see people doing different things. They're quite happy to let others be. They're happy to be in the forest, you know, and they have dialogues with different beings. They are in, in relationship. And of course, all that is going, all that is being you know, replaced by this way of seeing the natural world as hierarchized caste system. But how do we know that someone didn't look at something and then make a theory out of it to, to suit themselves? And so, you, and so one of the things I've been finding is you can see whatever you want to see in nature. You can. You can just go there and see it as you know, something terrible and awful and destructive and 
you can go and see it as creative. But the question is, the, what is your own interest in listening and in engaging and giving time and patience and also being subject to. So it's not that nature is your object to use, but also that you are subject to, you know, the work of other beings. So if you have that dialogue, only when you have that dialogue and exchange, can you, can you unpack some of these things and not make theories and constructs and arguments and then enable an entire way of being. Yeah, absolutely. You, I, you must be familiar with this, but this is something that has always struck me and this is a story I tell very often. Uh, Kropotkin, the Russian anarchist philosopher, read the same diaries of Darwin that the rest of the world was reading. But he was particularly struck by stories uh, that otherwise were not being shared in the mainstream discourse. For example, he picks up a story of Darwin's account of a community of pelicans where there's a blind pelican that is alive because the other pelicans fish for it. Yes. So it, even in the literature that has been uh, requisitioned or that is the basis of much of the mainstream discourse, uh, there is a huge element of selection. Oh, yes. And, you know, Darwin spoke about the intelligence of plants, you know, so he did not place, they, he saw this kind of place of being, which is an interbeing, that the intelligence of plants, um, and that's completely ignored. <laughs> so, yes, we select and we select to our convenience and we build our theories and justify our actions. So, Suprabha, so in the almost 30 years that you have been part of the uh, Botanical Sanctuary, can you uh, say more about the different ways in which you have seen humans uh, being part of uh, uh, the nature? What are the forms of human interaction and human existence within nature uh, that have given you a different perspective from what uh, the dominant uh, mainstream world knows to be human and nature. Yeah. So um, there are many levels of looking at it. And, you know, I'd like to sort of um, not look at the entity of Gurukula Botanical Sanctuary so much as the, be the, the people that I have sure, lived sure. with and connect with. And they are in the landscape and not necessarily just a formal structure. So you know, one of the most important things is that the interpretation of, of the word Gurukula by the person who founded our place was actually as family of nature. Mm -hmm. So the guru is nature and we are of the family of nature. So there's no, you know, man sitting there in Padmasana and lotus position and inward looking, but rather this whole um, community of where plants are actually the primary, the primary players and uh, uh, they determine what you do. So, so to live in the family of nature was the very first time that I actually thought, oh, here's a sort of a modern person, actually, you know, and he's not Adivasi, he's not of this land base, and he's interpreted the word Gurukula itself to mean, you know. Um, and then, obviously, there are, you know, in that part of Kerala or Kerala or the Western Ghats or any of these mountain areas in the tropics, the whole the whole um, cultivation itself is quite interesting because the traditional cultivation very much mimics the forest. So people have an understanding of very diverse land uh, life forms. So they're not just dealing with annuals like rice and grain. Mm -hmm. You know, an annual that's planted, you harvest it, you take the seed, then you know there's open soil and then you plant again. They're actually you know, there's tubers and there's climbers and creepers. And I think I mentioned this in that other talk that actually you start to, it's a, it's a really interesting thing for me to just see something as conventional as gardening and horticulture have this um, very wide um, knowledges and skill bases and observational, you know, the, 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 when something comes into fruit and flower, when it can be harvested, you know, how do you make cuttings of this? Which part of it can you plant? It's really diverse. It's, it's, it's a, of, a, of another dimension than just growing annuals. Yeah. So that itself was a very big thing. And then obviously within the landscape, you have people who are the Panyas, for instance, very old uh, tribal community. 
Um, you know, people say they're amongst the first uh, groups that were to have settled in this area. It's a very ancient, you know, 50,000 years or whatever, you know, according to the genealogical studies. But, you know, but they don't hunt. They don't have weapons to catch fish. They don't have hooks and, you know, I mean, the more recent, newer people, but they, they gather their fish in baskets. And um, so they make, they, they make these canals in the forests, in the, in the stream. They put, make little buns with the boulders and then pack it in with uh, the, the, the mud from the banks. And then they have little uh, openings and then so the water rushes out and then they catch the fish. But what, it seems like such a you know, primitive way, but actually, you know, they know their fish and it's the most harmless way. Yes. Um, and they have been in place and they have basically just a wooden stick for digging. You know, traditionally, that's all they had. So they dug tubers. They had so many different spinaches, leaf spinaches, bush spinaches that they could eat. So many mushrooms. And they sometimes would have a jungle fowl or they would eat crabs. And even the method of catching the crab is so simple mm. um, that, you know, that is one whole way of in a possible human experience culture that's just right there next to something that is you know say more like machetes hacking you know the forest is a dangerous dark place full of leeches and wildlife and so that's more the settler migrant culture people who have been alienated from their own lands very poor come up and then had to sort of conquer nature and put in their own um, you know for for their own uh, survival they've had to cultivate certain things that's another extreme and then you have the plantations which are these large areas full of you know just a single crop so in one you know in one walk you can take in very different relationships with or lack of relationships with the natural world you know, the kurchias are both hunters and cultivators and gatherers. So they, they can kill using a bow and arrow or stun, you know, with the, you know, the, the blunt uh, arrows or they can um, cultivate paddy and have very diverse uh, cultivations just around their, um, you know, clan, their homesteads. Mm. And then the gardeners who I live with, and that's been a journey in itself. And I am not a gardener at all. And... Um, it's a particular sensibility, but most gardening is a conversion of diversity to something that is very selective and um, for one's own aesthetic, whatever we define as aesthetic. But here is a whole way of uh, gardening that takes the conventional tools of gardening and turns it 180 degrees around to create, to see if the forests can be brought back in some way because species you know have been so hammered mm. that uh, gardening seems to be a very useful way to you know you can make cuttings and plant seeds and take tubers and you know little kikis and suckers and so on and then the way you grow these plants is actually uh, one step to block them from total extinction so and and my friends and um, they'll all laugh at me that my sensibility is still so you know it doesn't manifest in my fingers, uh, but then uh, you know maybe there are other things that I do, but you know they they someone can grow mosses and ferns, and that's a whole way of um, you know those are incredible beings in themselves, and uh, there are others who grow who look after orchids and orchids have a whole way of uh, pollination and seed production and the, then they need to land somewhere where there's a relationship with the mycorrhizal fungus you know and then there's someone else who's growing um, shrubs or the kurunjis of the mountains you know so they have each discovered and this, these are all new things in the sense that it's happened within the last two generations basically because you know, if you look at human history, very few plants have actually been cultivated, you know, across the world out of the hundreds of thousands of plant species, there are still very few that have been cultivated. And, and, and cultivation itself is a questionable act in one sense, because you're this whole act of domestic, domestication, creating controlled environments, then you have to deal with disease, then you have to, you know, um, chuck out the rats, and then you have to push out the wild boar and so it's, it's a constant uh, 
dance uh, of relationships. Yeah. And obviously you are engaged in the question of selection saying, okay, look, this is so endangered, this plant, that I think that you no know, Lantana should not be here. But Lantana wants to be there, yeah. you know. So you are making these decisions, but the hope is that what you do creates diversity and creates sustainability, that something has to sustain in the long run, not just in the short run. Yeah. So these are very special sensibilities, like every, every creature has a mind and a capacity. You know, the, again, the indigenous people will tell you that, that if you're, the otter has you know, one set of skills that the elephant doesn't have, and the elephant has a, you know, a whole set of capacities that uh, the kingfisher doesn't have. And, you know, and therefore, similarly with plants, they do actually, they do very different things. Yeah. A tree does different things from a little cushion of moss. And when you start to pay attention to that, you actually develop moss mind because you want the moss to be better for your engagement. You develop, you know, whatever. So you get, the, you get what I'm saying. Uh, no, actually, I want to go into this a bit deeper. Uh, which ties up with the question that I had saved. Uh, is ecosystem gardening a form of ahimsa or am I reading too much into that? Uh, by ahimsa here, I mean exactly this uh, dovetailed uh, complementarity and overlapping cooperation and co competition that you have described in the natural world. But to put it in a, in a nutshell, um, what you're able to do inside a, a secured space uh, like the Gurukula, the, the, the sanctuary, um, is uh, in a sense much more within your own realm of action. But what are the insights that we can take from ecosystem gardening and apply to the larger world? Uh, even in a very reduced manner, because um, I think most of us are not able to deal with the possibility that uh, the larger global system is now uh, kind of unstoppably hurtling towards self-destruction. Most people want to be able to feel that they can still do something about it. And is ecosystem gardening um, one approach that people can adopt outside wherever they are? What would be its forms in the mainstream life, if at all? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would be very cautious of saying that there is any one solution to, you know, to Holocaust. <laughs> but, um, but this one is actually much more powerful than people would give, you know, um, give it that kind of room in their imaginations. And it's really harmless in one sense. You know, it's, it's harmless in the sense that what are you saying? You're saying, look, let's, let life be. And my work here is to protect it. So there is an act of defense involved. And you can ask the question of what does defense itself involve, right? Does defense involve an act of, you know, is, it, is violence and counter violence the same thing? So, you know, so if someone was to come to cut a tree down and I defend the tree and then I have to do something to defend it if he is very, or, you know, very uh, brutal, what, what would be called upon from me to act in that situation? But you have to ask the question. You have to ask what it means to defend. And the second would be um, cultivation itself. And um, uh, so one is just to life, let life be wherever you are, wherever you are to allow, uh, to step back, to desist, resist the, the sort of all these um, atrocities that we are daily committing. You know, there's blood on our hands, no matter what, if you're a member of the modern industrial culture. But at the same time, if you think that life really can use every opportunity to have a little toehold, there can be a, a climber going up a wall, there can be seeds uh, germinating under something, there can be, you can take back that pavement slab in your front lawn, you know, give more room. And it, it sounds so crazy, I giving more room to other beings who, have, who are actually trying to reclaim their space. 
you know and this can this is for all walks of life you know life wants to live it's claiming its own space you know the birds the insects the reptiles the geckos the rats you know why do we have a war with rats but if you see that all life makes it possible sooner or later for other life forms to come very soon they're actually coming behind you know there's a weed going then there's a butterfly coming then there's some ants and then there's some uh, you know little sapling of a tree that couldn't have grown on concrete but there are these other you know so cracks in concrete so once you start to recognize that and then you understand the power of the ecosystem where you are wherever you are there is a biome actually there waiting to happen that had been there so what can you do to help that happen for me it would mean to take you know a lot of the concrete off but then that would be seen to be an act of violence you see yeah. if i say let's not have a road let's have a path that's an act of violence against the car culture and people who believe that they are entitled to have cars and and to pollute your own lungs so if i say look my lungs are being polluted let's have a tree here <laughs> that would be an act of violence in today's culture right yes yes yeah so you know how do you remove concrete how do you remove asphalt how do you you know regreen the world when the world is actually saying to rewild the world the human part of the world is saying to rewild the world is danger yeah it's an assault on civilization <laughs> before we close uh can you talk about Uh, the work you've been doing with school children i know that uh, there's a steady uh, stream of school children who visit and who uh, un- uh, who uh, do various kinds of programs at the sanctuary um so over the years uh, what have you uh, seen as i mean what are some of the ways in which students are young people basically children are responding uh to what you are able to introduce them to and what are some of the ways in which they seem uh, they are struggling with how to apply these insights to the world their middle class upper class uh, modern industrial society life that they all have to go back to after they have participated in your course yeah so urban we right now we're talking about urban kids who come and urban youngsters who come um you know almost inevitably we have seen this uh, you know this this wonder wonder that opens up and then uh, you know the, the eyes are just like absorbing such diversity and the ears are hearing such a you know such incredible bird song and insect song and and uh, you know they swim and and then they participate in the work of the community and and they sleep to um you know to the sound of crickets and frogs and you know the elephant might be there or you know um owls and so that the incredible diversity of sensations and you know being opened up literally through your body and your senses is a primary thing and obviously when people go back and you know the the cityscape is such an assault on the senses so we can also talk about that the violation of the senses that is happening in the city culture you know you, you know the sounds that you hear are always so loud you never have to listen out to something at the other end of your city district right of your zone you never have to listen out to what's happening on the in the next apartment block you know but in the forest your is your senses are in you know, incredibly expanded there is a, an intrinsic need to hear and sense far but it's not just a need it's a joy it's a joy of experiencing when you know you've heard that oh that's that you know bird out there and so that enlivening that happens you know does meet something very violent when it comes back and that's not intended by you know somebody driving or banging a door or turning on a machine he's not intending to violate your senses but what does it mean to live with that then yeah so um that that is actually quite difficult for a lot of people to go between this and that and why does it have to be only in the forest and then the forest becomes a special place to where you experience it and then the city comes this this other place where you have gadgets and things and pollution so that dichotomy has to end and so i would say that many of the youngsters who have come and grown up and then revisited many times and 
hopefully, you know, they have actually gone on to exploring how, you know, the city also needs rewilding. You know, you as a being in a city need your trees around you and the trees need you also, right? You know, as a person who's come alive to them. So the, the, the revitalize the rewilding of the human body, not through intensive outdoor sort of, you know, pursuits, which is the, the norm really is to go out and then you conquer the mountain or you do bungee jumping or white water rafting or something. You know, and so the, the, again, the way the modern human is taken out to the forest, and this, a lot of it is very suspect to me. And uh, I would, uh, you know, what about some kind of a gentle sort of, you know, participation, something that you can return to, something that, you know, you allow inside to break down your own barriers of who you are, you know, and can you live without all these others? So those are the questions that we try to explore with kids. And takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, the immediate encounter is always so fantastic, but it's also fearful. You know, the jungle, the forest, the leeches and so on. But over time, you know, you start to rest in it. And then to rest in this interbeing is probably, you know, what people go back with. Any closing thoughts, Sudraba, about uh, anything that, you know, we got left out? Would you want to just close on that? Yeah. Um, Maybe this is just something that I'm, I'm myself looking at now. You know, we're, we're so full of theories and full of, um, you know, ideas. Um, so in, in, in this conversation, it was really nice that we were able to actually look at different interpretations and how you might as a person also engage. So I just feel the, you know, to relate with nature, the rest of nature is, uh, it, it has to be immediate and the experience the experience has to generate the theory rather than the theory generating the experience uh, because we're so full of stuff that we have learned now that's pretty heavy and it's just like you know conditioned yes. us yes. so maybe that's what yeah and that in fact is also the experience that is emerging from most of the other ahimsa conversations that uh. this whole question of finding the capacity for ahimsa inside ourselves is mm. not dependent on, you know, some great events outside us, but is an inward journey in mm. which we experiment and uh, take steps in small, big, gigantic ways all together. Mm. Great. Yeah. So thank you so much. All the best. <laughs>